uh, good evening everyone i welcome you all uh, on behalf of acp india chapter for this another very interesting episode of acp india case file and today is really a very very proud moment for us because just day before yesterday the acp india case files has been awarded with uh, john tucker evergreen award at internal medicine meeting at chicago so and uh, this program has been widely acknowledged and applauded by all the other chapters of the american college of physicians so this is really a matter of pride for us and for to steer today's uh, program we have dr saurabh shivastav dr saurabh shivastav is a professor in the head of the medicine uh, at government institute of medical sciences greater noida he is also the chief medical secretary of the hospital he has a very vast academic background and uh, is highly and his efforts and work has been highly acknowledged at various level by different society he has special interest in diabetes and endocrinology and critical care and he was he has been awarded with prestigious gb generation abba ka tripathi award and the investigator of the year award in bp fund 2017 he is currently the uh, chairman of upda gautam buddha nagar chapter joint secretary of the he is secretary of the uh, uttar pradesh diabetes association and is uh, also uh, editor of various journals and textbooks so dr saurav i will hand it over to you now so that you can uh, proceed uh, with the acp india case file thank you dr amit acp india case file is a initiative by our governor dr anuj maheshwari and uh, advisory council member dr amit gupta whom you are listening early, uh, right now for the hand holding of the early early care physicians and we are proud as dr amit has already told you that the acp india case files has been awarded with the john tucker evergreen award at internal medicine conference at chicago and so this is a very proud moment for us and it has been recognized as a very good initiative by india uh, india chapter acp india chapter today we will be discussing the uh, very good case a rare case of adult onset cystic disease as well as how we can take up the uh, how we can be better with the the case and all that so adult onset cystic disease although it is considered as a rare disease it is not so much rare and uh, a very high index of suspicion is very much required to make a diagnosis and each and every clinical sign and symptom is to be taken into consideration uh, for today we have a very energetic speaker with us dr preeti dr preeti is head of the department at aims batinda he is nodal officer for hemophilia and thalassemia at aims batinda he is fscp diploma in non invasive cardiology he is member of screening committee for screening of applications to the officer member member selection committee for recruitment member infection control subject expert of general medicine for recruitment and he has done certified course in geriatrician and evidence based medicine diabetes management public health foundation of india dr mohan dapti education academy so i invite dr preeti to go ahead with our discussion and present the case of uh, the case so that uh, we can, we can get uh, insight about this disease over to dr preeti Good evening, uh, everyone. Uh, 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 sorry, Dr. Just, 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 uh, just, just, a, just a minute. Oh. Just a minute. I uh, missed one thing that we had a message from our governor, which we and Dr. Anil Maheshwari, who is busy in the internal meeting, internal medicine meeting at Chicago. So we will be playing first. We will be playing the message of our governor, and then we will go ahead with the case. Hi friends, this is Dr. Anuj Maheshwari, American College of Physicians, India Chapter Governor. It is proud privilege for me to inform that this edition of ECP case file is being given to you at the time when this particular program has been awarded by American College of Physicians, India Chapter as John Tucker Evergreen Award. across the world this program has been well appreciated and many chapters of the american college of physicians 
has liked this program. American College of Physician India chapter has always endeavored to bring good program for the early career physician which we are planning keeping in the mind to retain early career physician as a member of the college. We always look forward to help them at every step of their life including solving difficult cases at the same time financial planning, in insurance indemnity as well as making their life more happy and full of well-being. So this again a new edition of American College of Physician India chapter is coming up with you with ECP case file with the help of Dr. Amit Gupta who has helped me in conceptualizing this program at the same time he has also helped me in making this program more and more useful and successful for early career physician. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Anuj, for the elegant message. And now I invite Dr. Preeti, whom I have introduced earlier, for his case. Good evening, everyone. Thank you, Dr. Saurabh. I would like to thank respected Dr. Anuj Meheshwari, sir, Dr. Amit Gupta, sir, and the entire organizing team of ACP India chapter for inviting me here today on this esteemed platform. I shall be presenting a rare case report on adult onset still disease and I will be discussing the case report on adult onset still disease under the following headings. Adult onset still disease is a rare systemic autoinflammatory disorder of unknown etiology with both environmental and genetic factors playing a possible role in its pathogenesis. The annual prevalence of adult onset stills disease is 0.16 case per 1 lakh people in India, thus making it an extremely rare autoinflammatory disorder. Adult onset stills disease, the clinical picture presents as an overlap between various disorders and presents as a spectrum of symptoms mimicking various diseases like infections, vasculitis, malignancies, drug hypersensitivities, rheumatological conditions, thus making the diagnosis a very difficult process. Now let us come to the case which presented to us in our OPD two months back. A 27-year-old female, hypertensive for the last three years on irregular treatment, presented with chief complaints of fever since 10 days, rash on the left foot since three days, pain in bilateral knees and difficulty in walking for three days. So this is the patient who came to us in OPD two months back. She had fever for 10 days, which was continuous. It was associated with chills and rigors. It was accompanied by sore throat, pink erythematous rash with pruritus on left foot. She had pain in bilateral knees causing difficulty in walking and was unable to walk independently. Patient had similar complaints of recurrent episodes of fever over the last five years. It was associated with multiple joint pains, which were smitric, involving bilateral wrist, knees, elbows, and proximal interpharyngeal joints. On examination, the patient appeared ill. She had marked pallor and she was confined to the bed. On admission, her blood pressure was 150 by 90 mm of mercury. Pulse was 104 beats per minute. She had, high, uh, she had 100 degrees fever and was maintaining a saturation of 99% on room air. Further, on general physical examination, we noted that she had severe pallor. There was significant right submandibular, cervical, and inguinal lymphadenopathy. There was an ulcer on the lateral aspect of the right foot of the size 5 cm by 3 cm, of little toe of the right foot. Oropharyngeal examination revealed a mass or growth in the oropharynx. So this pic shows the non-healing ulcer on the lateral aspect of the right foot and dry gangrene on the tip of the little toe of the right foot. Nodule is visible on the flexor aspect of the left hand and they are prinkish salmon rashes over the foot. 
On systemic examination, the neurological examination showed power in the flexors, extensors, abductors and adductors of the left hand as 4 by 5, whereas it was grade 5 by 5 in the right hand. Loss of sensations in whole of the left palm could be appreciated. Musculoskeletal examination revealed a tender right knee joint with minimal swelling. So we further evaluated the patient with lab investigations and we found that she was having anemia with a hemoglobin of 6.7 gram deciliter. The TLC counts were raised with 86% of neutrophils. There was thrombocytosis. We got a peripheral blood film done, which showed an isocytosis with microcytes, mild hyperchromia, leukocytosis with neutrophilia and abundant platelets. Both the ESR and the CRP were markedly raised. On uh, doing the liver function test, we found that the LFTs were deranged with the raised AST levels, ALT levels, ALP levels. There was hypoproteinemia and with the albumin of 2.2 gram deciliter. Renal function test was also deranged with a urea of 57.4 milligram deciliter and the creatinine levels of 2.86 milligram deciliter. Serum electrolytes were found to be within normal limit. We further investigated the patient and got an iron profile done. So the serum ferritin was found to be markedly raised. It was 1000 nanogram per ml. Serum iron stores and percentage of transparent saturation were markedly decreased, whereas the total iron binding capacity and the UIBC was raised. Serum LDH was done, which was found to be within normal limits. On further investigation, we found that the rheumatoid factor was quantitative rheumatoid factor was within normal limit. The NTCCP, ANA were negative. ANCA and P ANCA profile was done, which was found to be negative. Patient had hypertriglyceridemia with the triglyceride levels of 241 milligram per deciliter. And the viral markers for HIV, HCV, hepatitis B, cytomegalovirus and Epstein-Barr virus were all non-reactive. Ultrasound abdomen with renal artery Doppler was done, which showed a bilateral medical renal disease with raised resistive index in the left kidney of 0.7. Arterial Doppler of the right upper limb was done, which showed no evidence of thrombus and a normal flow. We further evaluated the mass which was present in the oropharynx with the CECT neck, which showed an oropharyngeal, oropharyngeal polypharyngeal growth on the left side involving the ipsilateral posterior, one third of the tongue, the soft palate, the fossil pillars and the tonsillar fossa along with cervical lymphadenopathy. This mass biopsy was taken from this oropharyngeal lesion which showed acute on chronic inflammatory pathology. Then we got a wedge biopsy from the foot ulcer, which again revealed inflammatory infiltrates comprising mainly of neutrophils. Subepithelium consists of fibrocollagenous tissue with foci of acute and chronic inflammatory infiltrates. We got a 2D echo of the patient done, which showed a normal study ruling out bacterial endocarditis and pulmonary arterial hypertension. X-ray right ankle AP and lateral view was done, which showed no abnormalities. To rule out the infection part, we got the blood culture done, which was found to be sterile. We got the urine cultures done, which was found to be sterile. NCV showed left medial and ulnar nerve sensory motor axonal neuropathy. Because of the hypertension part, we got a fundus examination done, which revealed a disc edema with hypertens hypertensive papliopathy. Now, we uh, considered the following differential diagnosis in our patient. Viral infections, fever, rash, arthralgias, and lymphadenopathy uh, mimic the clinical picture of viral infections. But the long-standing history of recurrent arthralgias and the long-standing history of recurrent uh, fever in the past, along with negative viral markers, uh, uh, did not support this differential diagnosis of viral infections. Uh, and we got the negative viral serologies. Fever, rash, arthralgias and lymphadenopathy again mimic the clinical picture of vasculitis, but negative ANA, ANCA, PNCA profile did not support this differential diagnosis and were against the diagnosis of vasculitis. 
Features like fever, leukocytosis, elevated ESR, and CP, uh, CRP favor the diagnosis of acute bacterial infections. However, the negative blood cultures and urine cultures and the lack of other potential diagnostic clues made the diagnosis of acute bacterial infection less likely. The most probable differential diagnosis in this case appeared to be malignancy with metastasis was the most probable diagnosis owing to features like recurrent fever, cervical and inguinal lymphadenopathy, severe anemia, non-healing ulcer on the foot, polyvrative growth in the oropharynx. But the biopsy results and ultrasounding findings, however, counter the presence of any such malignant foci and made the diagnosis less likely. Rheumatological conditions also present with similar pattern of rash, arthralgias, and leukocytosis. However, negative rheumatoid factor levels, atypical pattern of rash, lymphadenopathy, and the recurrent occurrence of fever in the past year uh, made rheumatoid arthritis a less likely diagnosis. Other rheumatological conditions like SLE, also present with rash, arthralgias, and leukocytosis, which was ruled out in view of negative ANA test, as most of these conditions are associated with a positive ANA test. Drug reactions, cutaneous eruptions, leukocytosis, persistent fever can be commonly present in drug reaction, but it is commonly associated with eosinophilia and lymphocytosis, which, which was not the case in our patient as she mostly had neutrophils and there was no history of chronic drug intake or history of drug hypersensitivity. So to make a diagnosis of adult onset still disease, we require a clinical presentation which matches with the Yamaguchi criteria for diagnosis of adult onset still disease, which requires the presence of any five criteria with at least two major criteria. So the major criteria of the Yamaguchi criteria are fever for at least 39 degrees Celsius, intermittent lasting one week or longer, arthralgias or arthritis lasting two weeks or longer, a typical rash, leukocytosis more than 10,000 with 80% or more of granulocytes. Minor criteria are the sore throat, recent development of significant lymphadenopathy, hepatosplenomegaly, abnormal liver enzymes, particularly aminotransferases and lactate dehydrogenase. Negative tests of ANA and rheumatoid factor. And the exclusion criteria are infections, malignancies, and other rheumatic diseases. So application of this criteria in a current patient. Our patient had fever for more than one week, arthralgias more than two weeks, leukocytosis more than 10,000 with more than 86% granulocytes, accompanied by sore throat and significant lymphadenopathy. So after exclusion of all other possible diagnoses, a tentative diagnosis of adult onset Stills disease, hypertension with chronic kidney disease, and anemia secondary to iron deficiency plus anemia of chronic disorders was made. So treatment given. Early, during the early course of treatment, we started the patients with non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs for arthralgias and we need to put empiric antibiotics to treat the possible infections. But after ruling out infections and malignancy, TAP, prenislone, 0.5 mg according to the weight uh, per kg was started. Non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs were continued along with symptomatic treatment. And uh, coming to the follow-up of the patient, two months following steroids, fever had subsided, the rash disappeared, there was no joint pains, lymphadenopathy had subsided. And following two months following steroids, ulcer started to heal and the neuropathy had improved. Patient was able to walk independently and you can see the lipstick sign after two months of follow-up. So coming to the discussion part of adult onset still disease, it is a rare auto-inflammatory disorder that often escapes diagnosis owing to its low incidence and presentation that overlaps with a variety of other diseases. The etiology is unknown. However, some environmental and genetic factors have been suggested. Predisposing factors like HLA type B17, B35, DR2, DR5, DRB11 and infections including mycoplasma pneumonia, Campylobacter jejuni and Yersinia enterocolitica have been, uh, have been one of the predisposing factors for it. 
Patient presents with fever, which is quotidian or double quotidian. There is a salmon colored rash, predominantly involving the trunk, can but also involve the palms and the soles. Arthralgias are present, ranging from mild oligoarticular to debilitating polyarticular destruction of joints. There can be lymphadenopathy, hematological features like leukocytosis and normocytic normochromic anemia. Other clinical features can be pericarditis, pleural effusion, elevated liver enzymes, and generalized abdominal pain. Now, if uh, a, a adult onset still disease is not detected early and treatment is not initiated early, there can be complications which can be really life-threatening at times. One of the life-threatening complications is reactive hemophagocytic lymphohistiocytosis or RHL. It occurs at the time of diagnosis or during the course of treatment. High fever, falling ESR, falling leukocyte count, falling neutrophils with raised uh, with transaminitis and hypertriglyceridemia and hyperferritinemia are the various features. It is associated with high mortality. It can sometimes be precipitated by drugs which are used in the treatment of ASOD like interleukin-1 inhibitors and interleukin-6 inhibitors. The treatment involves high dose steroids, cyclosporin A and cyclophosphamide. Other complications are the coagulation disorders, DIC and TMA occurs in the acute phase. It should be suspected if there is mucosal bleeding, fulminant hepatitis and stroke. Thrombocytopenia, elevated PT, APTT and D-dimer. Again, the treatment requires ICU care, high dose of steroids, IVI immunoglobin, cyclosporin and sportive care. The less frequent complications can be pericarditis, tamponade, myocarditis and pulmonary artery hypertension. Pleuritis and interstitial infiltrates can be there. They can be fulminant hepatitis or secondary MLI, MLI doses can also develop as a complication of this disease. So how will we make the diagnosis? Mainly clinical, there is with non-specific biochemical and hematological abnormalities. There is elevated accused phase reactants like ESR and CRP. Leukocytosis with predominant neutrophils, negative rheumatoid factor and ANA test. Raised serum ferritin can provide a clue. However, there are no specific biomarkers that exist for the diagnosis of the disease. Amongst the several diagnostic criteria proposed, Yamaguchi, Yamaguchi criteria has the highest sensitivity. Now, iron deficiency and adult onset still disease. Iron deficiency anemia in adult onset still disease can present with raised serum ferritin. Iron deficiency and anemia of chronic inflammation can coexist. Even when ferritin level is elevated, it is entirely of iron-free apoferritin form. A, uh, adult onset still disease associated with coagulation disorders with microvascular thrombosis and dry gangrene were reported in few case reports. Similarly, peripheral neuropathy complicating adult onset still disease has also been uh, reported in very few case reports. Now, coming to the treatment part. Uh, coming to the treatment part. Uh, the milder form, the treatment uh, of uh, the adult onset still disease is mainly based on retrospective studies. There is no randomized double, uh, randomized, uh, double control placebo trials which have been done and the treatment is mainly based on the retrospective studies. So it is an empirical treatment. So in milder form of the disease, milder form of the disease, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs can be started at the initiation of the disease. These drugs uh, can be used in the sportive period during the diagnosis as a sportive treatment during the diagnostic process. They should never be used as first line agents because on retrospective studies, it has been found that they do not control the symptoms and increase the side effect. So, uh, for just for uh, the sportive treatment in diagnostic process, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory agents have been used. Corticosteroids. Corticosteroids are effective in treatment of adult onset still disease with high efficacy in patients with uh, systemic uh, features. The initial dose uh, have been 0.5 mg per kg to 1 mg per kg prednisolone. Tapering of the dose generally occurs after 4 to 6 weeks. High dose steroids, that is IV methylprednisolone pulse, can uh, be given in life threatening conditions like RHL and TMA. <coughs> 
Steroid dependence occurs in 42 to 45 percent of patients, leading to increased side effects. Methotrexate and methotrexate is a drug that is frequently used in the methotrexate is a drug that is frequently used in the treatment of adult onset still disease, and it has been seen that methotrexate. Uh, uh, the therapeutic efficacy generally comes from small retrospective case series where low de dose methotrexate 7.5 to uh, 17.5 milligram uh, in, uh, produces complete remission in around 69 percent of patients. Other drugs like disease modified anti rheumatic drugs are also commonly used in the management of adult onset still disease. <coughs> Interleukin-1 inhibitors, that is the Anna Kinra, is a <clears throat> first biological agent. Excuse me, please. And that showed beneficial, uh, beneficial effect in treatment of both systemic and articular features. It is supported by data on its efficacy in more than 250 published cases. Prolonged treatment is required for articular symptoms. Meta-analysis shows remission in about 80% cases and steroid sparing effect in 35% of cases. Tumor necrosis factor inhibitor in Fliximab is useful particularly in the articular cases and it is a third line of agent because the data on it comes from uncontrolled studies. Tosulizumab improves, improves both the systemic features as well as the articular features, causes remission of disease in 60 to 80% of patients and the dose being 162 mg per week subcutaneous or uh, 8 mg per kg per month IV can be given. So thank you, that was all about my case report. Thank you Dr. Priti. It was an excellent presentation, detailing about okay, each and every aspect of adult onset physical disease. I think that uh, you have covered each and every aspect and even the minor details of the cases such as neuropathy and all those have been also covered that these are also can be seen in this adult onset physical disease. Uh, Ankit, can I get some questions if there are some questions in the chat box? Again, uh, I will reiterate that uh, as you will also agree to me that always a high index of suspicion is very much required. Yes. And in this case also, as we have already seen that there was not a very efficient markers which would have been suggested that this is the case of adult onset disease. But it's still a slight rash with the fever and arthralia had given a clue on which you proceeded and got the other markers and the patient got fitted into the criteria for Yamaguchi Yama criteria of adult onset still disease. Yes. So again, this is very important that everyone should have a high index of suspicion for each and everything and every early care physician should, should keep his mind open and everything should be there and you should keep an eye on each and every sign and symptoms which are there in a patient because patient speaks by himself or herself. So you should have an eye on all, all the features and all the symptoms to be able to reach a diagnosis. And once you have reached a diagnosis, it is very easy to give a treatment. Yes. So from our point of view, we should have a high index of suspicion for each and every sign and symptoms and then we should proceed with the case. Yes. Most of these cases present as pyrexia of unknown origin. Yeah, yeah. So high case of suspicion is required because there is not a single biomarker for diagnosis of this disease. I think there are no cases, no comments and uh, no questions. So uh, we will, yeah, yeah. We got one question from Deepak Jain who is asking, what is the long-term prognosis of adult onset physical disease? Uh, so the long-term prognosis of adult onset still disease, uh, in one-third cases of the patient, adult onset still disease will recover, uh, there will be a single episode of adult onset still disease and after initiation of the treatment, there will be no relapse. 
but again in another one third patient of cases we can have relapse the relapse are though not very severe and they can be managed with treatment but there is another one third uh, patient group of patients in which there will be recurrent relapses and patient may require immune immunosuppressant drugs to manage those relapses so kindly unmute Dr. Deepak, you must have got your answer. I think if there are no questions, we can move to the second uh, talk. Uh, Ankit, please uh, give the CV of Dr. Kenyo. So the second talk is again, how a doctor can keep him, themselves fit in their busy schedule. And this is very important for every physician, not only early care physician, it is important for every physician that he should know how to keep himself or herself fit in his busy schedule. And Dr. Ken Yom is CMO, SG Commandant in Sports Medicine and Trauma Specialist. He is currently attached with training directorate in CRPF as a Chief Medical Officer and in charge of sports and training, and training of CRPF. He has served in Northeast, Assam and Kashmir, downtown Srinagar mainly as a GDMO and combat doctor. He hails from Northeastern states of Arnachal and Meghalaya. Fellowship, he has got fellowship in accident, trauma and emergency from MS Ramaya Medical College, Bangalore and has got his position in a sports medicine from Patiala, Punjab. Dr. Kinjom will be talking to us about how we can keep ourselves busy in our busy schedule. Over to Dr. Kinjom. Dr. Kinjom. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Saurabh, sir, for introducing uh, me. And uh, I also thank the ACP Indian chapter for inviting me. And it was a very good talk from Dr. Preeti uh, about Stills disease. I handled a few of them. And this is like, uh, sir, you rightly said that. Uh, I hope I'm audible. Am I audible? Yes, sir. Yeah, you are audible. You are audible. You are audible. Okay. So uh, just coming to that, because uh, there was uh, this thing of high index of suspicion uh, regarding still disease AO, and uh, we, it, is, uh, it was a very uh, illuminating talk and just a good revision because normally we don't see uh, these cases. You know, I haven't seen still disease for more than 10 years now, but we always keep a suspect, uh, you know, for, uh, and then you can always refer the patient to the right doctor. So uh, just coming to my talk and after, uh, you know, medical and technical talk mine will be a little bit more of a conversation kind of stuff and very important because i think uh, uh, i believe it seems to be a very simple topic but i think that it uh, it is very very important uh, in terms of uh, young doctors not only young i say why only young everybody should uh, take care of our own health and uh, doctors are supposed to be the guardians of health and disease for the country but we don't seem to take care of our own health uh, which is uh, simply because most of the time it's because of the lack of time, which we say, but also would be the lack of drive maybe. And also uh, I think more of the lack of culture of uh, being fit. But I think uh, now the times uh, have changed and uh, with, uh, I'm just trying to, uh, am I allowed to screen share? Yes. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, I'll just share my screen. Uh, your screen is visible. Yes, thank you. I, I got it. So, just a second. I'll, I'll straight away go with my presentation. Okay. So, uh, which we feel is very important, but uh, that's why uh, the talk is here today. It's how can doctors keep themselves fit in their busy schedule? And I just added uh, two lines of my own here, sir, which uh, says making time for exercise and fitness. So uh, I think especially after uh, this COVID situation and with the rampant uh, action of, uh, uh, you know, sad incident of uh, publics misbehaving with doctors and the medical college and the medical staff, it used to happen even in our time. Uh, Rarely in the medical colleges because you're in strength, but normally these happens in 
small centers and nursing homes and all that stuff. So I think that's also the reason why we need to uh, work on our fitness. So this would be uh, the general story of uh, each and every doctor, I think, that we are trying to excel in our career, studying, maintain social life, you know, the hydrate well, try and get exercise, text everyone back, text messages, telemedicine, people want the treatment on the phone. We stay sane, survive and also be happy at the end of the day. So uh, with the topic, basically, as young doctors, we get busier and busier. Exercise is unfortunately one of the first things that we compromise on, exercise and fitness, which means that it's a compromise on our own health, which is a compromise on our quality of life and productivity. Because I always feel that a fit and healthy doctor will always be more efficient and more useful to the society and to the patient. So uh, I'm here today to just discuss with all of you that it is your health and fitness should be the last thing to compromise and how we can manage, you can manage to exercise every day, even when you are super busy. So uh, most of us, you know, struggle with making time for, uh, especially uh, this was more to do with the young and upcoming doctors. Do we make time because we have a crazy OPD schedule? The patient load is, uh, it's, it's going uh, heavy OPDs, especially those in government and even in private now. I, I don't see the difference. Before we say a lot of heavy load in, uh, in uh, the government also. But if you look in a government hospital, if there's an OPD of say 100 patients, or 150, 250 patients, we have a, a unit head, we have an HOD, we have an assistant professor, we have uh, you know junior resident, senior resident, PGs to at least assist with the OPD. But uh, in the private setup, you're all alone most of the time managing your own OPD. So, uh, and with a very heavy load. So I think this is one of the times. And then you have your clinical meetings, your emergencies. So you can never sort of uh, uh, get exercise because by the time you're done with the duties, you're almost tired, fagged out, fatigued. And add to this, those who are married. Some people marry young. Then you have your kids to take care of. You feed them. You, and nowadays with, you know, single uh, uh, families, uh, with both the husband and wife working, with no help around, it is very, very difficult. So that's when you think that your sports game, spin class, date, your yoga mat or friendly matches you had, you know, when you were uh, in the, uh, you had in your college time when you were not married or when you're not fully joined a job, then that's the first thing to go from your daily uh, to-do list. Even for those who have been physically active before they started getting onto the practice or the initial phase of the uh, career. So it's exactly during those times when you feel like you're running out of time instead of running. So your workout becomes more important than ever, actually. So not just if you're working towards a goal or training for a race, but because even 20 minutes of your physical activity can drastically improve your mood, mindset, overall well-being. And that's good for you, actually. Uh, your boss, your head of, uh, head of the department, your kids, your wife, and your significant other, your family. So uh, basically what I've done is how can you make time for exercise when life feels crazy you have 10 ways to keep your workouts in rotation no matter how busy you are so for those who wants to you know generally as doctors we like to make notes so i just uh, got a lot of stuff together but i said 10 basic things that we can take care of so we'll talk on balance routine and versus flexibility we like to balance our life we always say we want a balanced lifestyle then lifestyle modifications and alternative exercise or physical activity uh, we have scientific process and social media for behavioral change, and we can take WhatsApp group, FA, Insta, etc. Uh, prioritize exercise over unproductive tasks. Find something you enjoy, anything that makes you move. Uh, remember, our bodies are designed to move, not to sit in one place. Master your mindset and get inspired by life uh, stories of people or colleagues we can relate to. Uh, you know, we can't relate to Olympic level athletes or to bodybuilders or anything, but we can relate to people like us who are doctors actually and uh, who have done it from getting obese, fat, unfit to become exceptionally fit and even going beyond uh, to a level some have gone to become world champions and in particular field, you know, because doctors, uh, whoever have gone on to study, have all gone through the end of hard work. So I think for us, the uh, hard work is never a challenge. I think it's just uh, taking out the time and getting our priorities correct. And of course, uh, seventh would be join... Uh, the most convenient gym or sports club possible, uh, meeting and connecting with friends over exercise, you know, make it a date, keep your workout clothes and kit handy at all times, uh, exercise anytime you can, when you can. That myth that you need to get up early in the morning to exercise, or, you know, uh, I would like to discuss on those. So we look at the first of the 10 basic commandments is balance the routine versus flexibility. 
So we are all creatures of habit and routines. And these are incredibly powerful as we take out the energy required for thought. And that automates our behavior. As much as uh, we love routines, I've learned since starting MBBS and residency that flexibility is also immensely important. You know, even in MBBS, uh, I am from KGMC Lucknow. Our classes start at 7.38. We finish at 8, 9 o'clock. We used to have uh, uh, clinical postings in the evening, 6 to 8. That used to be. So we used to squeeze out time for exercise. I think it was, uh, you uh, you cannot just take you, like you have to get up at 5 or 6 o'clock in the morning to exercise. If you can, that's great. But if your residency program or if your patient work or emergency duties doesn't allow it, you'll have to find a way around it. So on a typical day, say in a residency or for doctors, we go around at 7 to 8 a.m. in the hospital or the clinics and we get out around uh, 6 a.m. in the morning next day or 8 p.m. the next day, excluding the, you know, the 24, uh, 24, 48 hours, 70, 72 hours of match scheduling or duties that we have, especially, you know, emergency, casualty, surgery, post-op. So all the doctors here, we know this is how we all go through. However, there are days where we start later and we get out earlier also, or days when we start earlier and get out later. So if I was to focus on maintaining a routine, I would never work out since my work hours are often unpredictable. I wouldn't be able to work out at the same time every day. I have since learned that being flexible with the limited time I have is of utmost important. So I'll just tell you an example. Say when I was doing the residency in Sabdajam. So if you're doing a 24 hours duty, you start at eight in the morning and uh, you finish at 11 o'clock tomorrow, next day. If you remember anybody who's doing PG, probably this is still the schedule because even if you have a 24 hours duty next day, you can leave only after the HODs rounds. So after the HODs rounds and all the sampling and everything has been done. And then we get out of the hospital. So what I used to do, I was in Savdazim hospital in Delhi. So I stay in Kalkaji. I used to stay in Kalkaji then. So I used to get out because I'm discussing on and off today, but of what we would do as young doctors, I would go and route park at Deer Park, get in a run in the park carry your water bottle and everything. I'm talking about 20 years back. Get in a run, get in some fitness schedule. Just go and walk in the park because uh, beer park here, find a place. Because once you get into your house, you're going to sleep. So get into the house, uh, you will go to sleep. Or get into your hostel room, you're going to sleep. So go out straight to the park, walk, do some stretching, do some running, put on some music, you know, and then uh, watch nature a little bit. So that is one way of just staying physically a little bit fit. And... Uh, uh, of course, if you have joined some club and something also, that also be good. If you're very tired, of course, get asleep and get out and try and do some exercises. 15 to uh, 30 days is something that you need to just get into a routine uh, or into some kind of routine. After that, you'll, you'll get used for it. Actually, your body will start craving for exercise. So uh, how would you implement this? So your schedule will be almost like change throughout your college or medical career. Then your schedule is more predictable. Lean on routines to automate your exercise. Like now, once you're into a clinic, so you have a 9 to 11 clinic, then a 12 to 1 clinic, and then you have a travel time. So for those doing clinics and when you are the boss in your just an OPD clinic and you're not managing hospitals or emergencies, uh, you can still uh, somehow manage. But uh, it is difficult for people who are working in emergency settings. And uh, when your schedule is unpredictable, as it is often during residency, then lean more heavily on flexibility and remind yourself to seize the moment whenever you have the downtime. Uh, take care of your body. We all know it's the only home you have. Uh, a little bit about nutrition. So I think I don't need to teach doctors about nutrition, but uh, you just go to any of the canteens or uh, in the uh, medical colleges, canteen and hospital. So uh, the food is all uh, not really healthy that we eat. So I think we still need to look a little bit on this. If you have the resident association or in the uh, in the uh, hospital clinics, if you can speak to the people, the contractors to ensure that you have better food. So eating is a necessity, but eating healthy is an art. Eat for the body you want, not for the body you have. So we end up having all those pakoras and samosas and anybody who's done a good surgery, it's always a pakora samosa party, you know. So let's look at if we can get a better quality of food on the table. So lifestyle modifications and alternative exercise of physical activity, because most of us are either sitting, clinics, or surgeons who are standing and operating. So we either having long sitting and long standing. At least when you're a student as a PG, you're running around the wards, you're drawing samples, you're doing your pre-op, post-op work, you're going to the path lab, you know, you're having discussions, you're moving around, uh, you 
move around from one floor to the other. Like when we were doing our residencies or when we were doing MBBS, we'd go from first floor, second floor, third floor. So you actually indirectly end up having a lot of exercises. But I think as, as you specialize, you start being only on one floor. And then of course, uh, everybody likes to use the lift. So I think first and foremost, if you can uh, not take out time for exercise, at least try using the lift instead of using, uh, try using the, st the stairs instead of the lift. Uh, at least, or if you're on the eight or nine floor, it's too much, then just use means four floors of the lift and four floors you can walk. And as you get stronger and fitter, you can gradually increase the number of stair climbing. That is also a pretty good way. And uh, the other is if you're biking uh, to and from work, I know it's very difficult for, for some place like Delhi or other places where it's not safe. But like when I was doing my PG in Patiala, uh, for all night duties, uh, I would go by cycle. Uh, because I can go in my little bit of casual wear for night duties. I used to take the bike, put it in the resident doctor's room, lock it, which is a good bike, bike as in cycle. And after duty, the next day, you can cycle back to the hostel, uh, which was five kilometers or six kilometers away. So I think that would also be working. So I think everybody knows these things, but I think it's just a question of, you know, putting your mind to it and uh, first tuning to the fact that I need to get fit. I need to take care of my health. So... Uh, another thing is we have this concept that we go to the gym and we just need to lift a lot of weights and do a lot of heavy lifting. It's not required. If you just go to the gym, uh, you can always do cycling. You can always do a little bit of cross trainer. You can use a rowing machine. If you're tired with the legs, you've been walking the whole day, you can do a rowing machine. Uh, you could go swimming on the way or best you can walk. Uh, for those people, say, for example, somebody working in AMS or Sufficient Hospital or RML, which is close to say Apollo hospitals, which is close to a metro station, probably you can just uh, take commute by metro station and uh, go from one metro to another. At least you will get some amount of exercise because now I think most doctors are enough well to do. They all have a bike or a car and we tend to use motorized transport a lot. I think we should try to go a little bit of walking where it's possible. Uh, and I already discussed about elevator and stairs and uh, See, uh, we love watching Netflix movies, serials, sports channels, etc. in the weekend or in the weekends or late night when we're getting rest. So if you have a house of your own and if you have some space, you could probably uh, invest in a small wheelchair or a cross trainer or something like that. So while you're watching the news or movies, you can actually do a little bit of movement. You know, once you're warmed up with the, so while watching the movie or the cricket match or the IPL, you can go on with the exercise cycle or the cross trainer and do some stretches with the yoga mat. Uh, etc. Uh, and of course, like we say, we can, those who are studying for higher studies, like, you know, doing for those who have done MS, doing MCH, going for higher studies or going for PhDs, you can use your study breaks also when you're studying also, and uh, you can just do whatever stretch, move, dance, jump, just move. I think that's important. Of course, we look at scientific process. When you look at scientific process, we've all studied physiology. So we can do a little bit of own studying of uh, uh, physiology of exercise. And uh, uh, based on that, you know, we can work. And there are so many apps also, uh, which you can use regarding heart rate, conditioning, VO2 max, lactic acid. So you don't go with high tech when you're starting out, but we have all the apps that we can use, which tells us to exercise, how much to exercise. So the other thing which we've done with our batch is, uh, we have um, MBBS, you know, batch, we have a WhatsApp fitness groups. So only those people who are into uh, uh, fitness, right from the moderate level to the really fitness freaks, we put in a thing, we get together. Some people in the same city, they, they've started, you know, getting a biking group, the cycling club, a horse riding club, trekking, mountaineering, whichever possible in the morning, in the evening, whenever possible. So when you have a group, what happens is if you're not in the mood to exercise too, your other four friends is going to message you or call you, let's go play badminton, play tennis, let's go for a small cricket match together on a weekend or something. So I think you need to uh, uh, join those kind of groups, which is, I think it's almost there in every MBBS batch. And of course, uh, if you want, if you're interested, you can also then get more, if you get better and higher levels of fitness, you can go into trekking and mountaineering groups and clubs, you know, corporate cricket, football, basketball clubs, futsal, etc. you can join once in a week. So once you're uh, planning to really go to a higher level, you whole week you'll try and do some kind of fitness because you have a goal to go to. And of course, I already spoke about the various fitness apps that we can use. Um, 
then you of course like we say prioritize exercise over unproductive tasks we are all busy doing a variety of tasks throughout the day but we have to constantly ask ourselves how important each task is and whatever whether or not it is getting us closer to our goals goals for most of us is basically in the long run is to have a good life to become excellent doctors clinicians uh, physicians uh, surgeons you know that is one but at the same time our goal is also to stay happy and fit so to go along with that so we often waste our scrolling through social media instagram watching tv playing video games etc so unless these activities align with our aspirations and goals then they are most likely not making a meaningful contribution to our lives so in order to exercise regularly we should prioritize our workout sessions over these unproductive tasks so and you know that exercise not only benefits your health and mental well being it allows you to stay focused on your daily task and our task are to become excellent clinicians increase focus leads to increase productivity which ultimately leads to you reaching your goals faster one of the most uh, reliable ways to ensure you exercise regularly is truly enjoying your exercise so i would say here most of the time what happens is when you start out exercising we end up going to exercise with people who are really good in walking very fast walking or running so don't do that you can go to a gym or club somebody who can help and train you but always do something because uh, we doctors and we have a lot of uh, unless you've really been training or you've played at national level or state level to some extent you know i should say that don't go for the pain uh, no pain no gain belief which they say in gym no first you should have enjoy be enjoying yourself it's only at the later stage when you cross the moderate level when you really really now you go to the next level so you'll need to go for progressive overload in progressive overload you're going to have soreness not pain you're supposed to have muscle soreness post exercise muscle soreness not pain pain is definitely looking at injuries and if you have pain you're not going to enjoy uh, going back for the exercise again for example you love to cycle suddenly you go to a cycling gang which doesn't cycling like 100 kilometers 50 kilometers in a day and you just cycled you're going to have saddle soreness you're going to have uh, tendonitis you're going to have so many issues uh, you know so start slow start slow make sure you enjoy it and we need to be real realistic with it with it also so uh, and choose something that you love and that's important choose an, a physical activity that you love and like we said again master your mindset and get inspired by life stories of people or colleagues we can relate to now if it's very difficult for us to be inspired by olympians or thing you know we get inspired but to do that kind of uh, uh, thing which you know they have been to be an olympic medalist like neeraj chopra or uh, any of these uh, top level athletes uh, they have started from the age of 5 or 6 7 8 9 you know and they've been training for 15 20 years so uh, it is uh, even if they stop exercising they become very unfit so uh, i think when we start out for us we should look at whom we can relate to we look at doctors we look at colleagues whom we can relate to think of working out as something enjoyable never think of it as something you have to do but instead of something you want to do this has worked for me for so many years there are so many inspirational and transformation stories amongst our medical fraternity of every specialty you can even talk to whom we can talk to personally and ask for tips also so i just give you some small example here we have uh, dr sagar bedi he is on facebook a lot and this is how he was a couple of years back and then he started working out and this is how he is today i think this is slightly older pic of which i got from him with his permission of course and uh, this is how he's gone to a next level now and he's a guy who loves to eat not exercise and just do emergency duty he's so exhausted he go back, goes back home and sleep and he enjoys time with his family he loves to cook he still loves to cook he still loves to eat he continues that but now he's eating healthy so this is him today and uh, uh, dr palvi aga i took her permission today to put these photos of her uh, she had been an assistant professor of radiology in kgmu and uh, she resigned when she saw that it was taking too much of her health and time and so much of a sitting job when we first uh, communicated i just give the same advice which i've given you guys she went on to start doing small walks and uh, you know small little exercise issues and everything and then she took a decision that my health is most important and with seeing so many health issues in the family too and this is how she looks today she is based in delhi now and she is now giving advice to elite runners elite cyclists um, nutrition to so she she has doing that which she's doing still doing her radiology but it takes a lot of guts to uh, uh, resign from the post of a professor of radiology in kgmu uh, and to go and pursue your dreams and her dream was basically it started out just to get fit and healthy and not to fall sick all the time 
and she felt that it was not if i'm not asking all of you to leave your jobs like she did sagar didn't leave his job he's still continuing doing what he's doing i'm continuing what i'm doing all right but this is one of the few examples you know that when you decide to do it and pallavi was never into exercises and all sagar at least when he was in college he used to play cricket and all so you can still attribute that so i think uh, even in your own batch mates in your college seniors your colleagues you will find such examples and you can talk to them and how they did it and then you find out what is best for you and use it the other thing i would say is join the most convenient gym swimming pool sports club possible we don't want to contribute uh, 5000 or 5000 rupees why should we give we feel it's a waste of money but we go out and uh, you know spend money on drinks and even cold drinks which is not healthy and food and you just go out for a movie and a dinner it's 5000 but we are not willing to invest 5000 rupees for a club charges which you have our option so you don't have anyone you can play squash you can play and when you go to a club you meet people which is very important and then if there's a club or a gym nearby it's you just have to cross the road so look for something which is close by because you end up going in a vehicle and uh, you don't find parking you don't find this and you lose the drive so i think it's very important if uh, you can get something which is close by which you can uh, at least start with going to next level then i think nobody can stop you wherever it is but it's always the initiation part of it the starting part of it and of course like i said meeting and connecting with friends family over exercise you know make it a weekend day friendly cricket football basketball matches with friends colleagues uh, which i already discussed in the previous uh, initial part and another tip i would like to give you is uh, when i was doing my uh, fellowship in bangalore we didn't have time but what i did was i joined a a weekend uh, salsa class because i just felt i wanted to learn salsa and i did salsa and then from there i learned a little bit of merengue we learned a little bit of uh, dancing and it takes a lot of energy it takes our lot of energy and it's a very good place to meet people it's a very good place to meet people and make new friends too which is really good and uh, of course uh, we aim to for a cumulative movement you know over a long period of time it's not that you just go on just a weekend or just one day and you exercise so hard in the gym and the whole day you're just sitting so i would just add that for example what i do also is when i have to see patients uh, i see the patient in the consultation room if possible uh, uh, see we have the physiotherapy unit i examine because the physiotherapy tables are broader so if i examine patients i write go right up there and examine the patients over there so even walking to just examining the patients also sometimes helps and sometimes if i need certain investigations to be done i walk with the if possible i walk if i have time i walk with the patient to the lab and then i discuss with the pathologist or the radiologist on what are the investigations to be done and we have a little bit of clinical discussions so for those who can do this i'm sure in a in say a corporate hospital you can always go to the uh, radiologist and just discuss your cases with the radiologist face on so you make better relationships and you end up walking a little bit which is good for your uh, health and then of course you have these uh, clinical you know uh, discussions with your colleagues which will help you in managing your patients better and uh, the other thing is keep your workout clothes sport kits at hand if you're somebody who drives you know you can always uh, keep like a swimming supposing you like to swim or learning to swim on your way home you can learn to swim so you can just keep ensure that you keep a kit because we all carry bags nowadays you know uh, uh, for those students or even junior doctors we carry bags and those for senior a little bit on the senior side you have a car you can keep it in the booth or the dicky if you can if you kit in the dicky and the uh, you know if you just feel okay aaj mere jaldi opd ho gaya two patients cancelled one surgery got cancelled one surgery finished fast uh, we finished our rounds earlier you could just go into the gym or the swimming pool or the club and take out time for whichever uh, sports or physical activity that you choose i think that will help you and of course i always say exercise any time you can whenever you can get up even earlier this year you have to get up early no don't wait for that perfect tomorrow or new year's resolution or birthday or some miracle day to start exercising for getting fit exercise and keep moving whenever wherever given the opportunity keep moving aim to get stronger too as that will benefit you and your profession too because most of us we look at only aerobics find in a balance like i said where you do both aerobic and anaerobic and strength training exercise uh i see that most of us i have a few doctor friends who are into martial arts so if because martial arts is one thing we always think of in terms of contact a lot of martial arts we have our own uh, you know it's like yoga where you have your own uh, uh, different different katas and also in karate where you can do the drills yourself so wushu and all that stuff you can pick up weapon so you can think of martial arts as a source of fitness because once you learn initial phase maybe you learn some coaching and uh, let me tell you one thing we think nothing of it but people are willing to help doctors because if 
anybody approaches i've seen moment you tell people that you're a doctor it's not a bad world out there i've seen a lot of trainers and coaches are willing to teach and help you provided you take out the time so they are willing to do it for free also for you and if you definitely pay nothing like it so as a source of fitness you can start doing some uh, physical mainly you know you can learn some martial arts and all because it's excellent ways of building strength and thing and it gives you a lot of confidence and most important tomorrow should we be attacked at least you will know how to uh, uh, self defend yourself uh, so just few martial arts sports pictures here the other thing is uh, if you have an opportunity this is just a photo so i was given a, an assignment say to uh, give a medical cover to the divyangs as in you know the specially abled uh, of our forces to from sabarmati gandhi ji's ashram to uh, uh, here in delhi at the uh, uh, the ghats so uh, uh, rajghat okay so uh, this what i did was and i requested uh, the ambulance and everything was moving along but i requested uh, that why can't i cycle along with them so uh, we went for the opening ceremony and then later on i requested them sir can i use my own bike so i got my bike and then i've been cycling with them so it was a duty the whole day but at the same time i enjoyed my duty i managed to get fit so if you're on a duty for a marathon say and wherever possible and you're covering a marathon duty uh, people are running you're on a bike so you can you can give a medical cover through the bike cycle also so these are small small things that you can do perhaps there are a lot of sports where say in a football match i can't move i'm supposed to sit there and keep my eyes on the field but there are a lot of um, events where you can give if you are asked to give cover to an event uh, wherever possible you know try to get involved and move uh, just one picture here to say whatever sport so tennis trekking uh thank you all for your patient hearing um, i wish you all good luck for your career and health in the new age and challenging times of covid-19 stay safe stay strong if you want to connect with me uh, this is my email id and my whatsapp number i'd be very glad to help doctors to find road to fitness we also if you can see the logo there is the uh, uh, indian society for sports and exercise medicine which is a group of sports medicine specialist we are all there to help at least if we don't help our own uh, colleagues and the same medical fraternity i think uh, uh, it would be a crime for us not to help uh, our fellow doctors and actually a lot of doctors now are getting into fitness also you look at the social media websites and all everybody is doing great because we uh, know the anatomy physiology uh, biochemistry of exercise you know so i'm sure uh, once we put our minds to it we can do it uh, not having time is just i think is an excuse it's just a priority i think see look whatever life we need a priority we take out time for that so if we are not keeping our health and fitness as a priority that is the problem so i think we just need uh, to keep health and fitness as a priority work out well eat well be patient your body will reward you your mind will reward you and i'm sure we'll do much much better in our careers and a lot of contribution to the society too. thank you so much thank you dr kanjom it was a very good thought provoking talk and probably the messages where there is a will there is a way so you should be ready every time for the exercise and first and foremost thing is that first love yourself and then you will be able to love others and your patients so that is the basic of uh, being fit and uh, one thing i must say that every doctor has a treadmill has a bicycle which is being used for some other purpose not for <laughs> doing exercise so i think that <laughs> this inertia should go and we should be there to have some workout and have some exercise in, in our life and that is very much important and every time where wherever you want you can have an idea and have a opportunity for exercise you just use that opportunity and that will be keeping us healthy dr amit uh, i think uh, it is highly impressive and uh, dr ken jomal uh, you are really an inspiration for uh, the entire medical fraternity and uh, uh, the slide which you have shown in the way in which you have presented and actually you have given the solutions to us you not only talked about the fitness but you have actually uh, because you have gone through that situation then you have actually given all the possible solutions uh, to us so that i think it would be great
we can have a live session with you and we can talk more about the fitness and that would be wonderful and dr pt's case was also excellent because uh, uh, she talked about a very rare case the adult onset fitness disease and uh, the way it was presented and the way it was discussed and uh, everything was in place i hope it is a good learning for everyone who attended today the videos will be available later uh, at our acp uh, acp india youtube handle for future viewing and i think it's amazing uh, i have been glued to the both the talks uh, today uh, though i am at airport and traveling to hyderabad and the but some of the flight code delay so i had the chance to listen to both the speakers thank you thank you very much thank you, over sir. to dr saurabh thank you thank you thank i you. think uh, the we can conclude the session right now and we have discussed at large about the rare disease also and the idea about how to be how can we keep ourselves fit so we can conclude the session